got the whole world in it.
We're going to continue, and Randy is going to lead us in, uh, I believe a friend of his wrote this song. Is that the right story, Randy? Oop, caught him in the middle of business. <laughs> no, I didn't have a hand writing this one. A friend of mine. Your friend of put, yours wrote it, right? No, she put no. it on an album. No. <laughs> uh, and it's just a continuation of the last song, really. Sometimes we have problems. And we're trying so hard to solve them, we forget to stand still and let God move. <laughs>
Throughout our lives, if we are wise, we understand that we never stop learning. And once we stop learning, then life is no longer an adventure, but it moves to just sustaining. In 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, Peter writes, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Father, thank you for, the, for your word. And Lord, as we look at uh, what I believe Peter clearly expressed to us through the Holy Spirit and you by, uh, by your awesome word, Lord, that we are to be in growing, of uh, growing knowledge of you. And Father, we just pray that the Holy Spirit will move in an awesome, powerful way. I pray now that I may decrease, that you may increase in Jesus' name. Amen. The more we study, the more we find out what we know and what we don't know. Anytime you're studying anything and you're getting more in-depth in it, you will discover all the things that you do know, but... And the flip side of that, you also discover those things that you did not know. Uh, this is Peter's final book, written while Nero was the emperor in Rome. Peter was also, also was very much aware that his time on earth was nearing its end. And when you pause to think of that, uh, about that, uh, if you know you have one final message, for family, for those that you love, you will want to be, to be very serious. You will want to be careful with the words and the wordings that you use, and so it is with Peter. For several years in churches, there have been a trend that we turn our brain off and we allow the, our feelings to absorb the teachings of Jesus. That it's all about feelings. Do I, did it feel good? Well, you know, friends, in your walk with Christ, if you only walk with Christ and pray and, and study the Bible when you feel like it, you probably don't do it a whole lot. Our relationship with Jesus Christ, yes, there are feelings that the Holy Spirit gives us that encourages us and motivates us, but that's not the underlying factor. In fact, Peter here, 14 times in this final three chapters, says in relation to word of knowing and knowledge. It is about growing in knowledge with Jesus Christ. It says here, for this very reason, in 2 Peter 1, 5, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge. In Matthew 22, 37, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, then watch this, and with all your mind. It's a knowledge thing. 1129, a very familiar passage, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Learn from me. We are not speaking of degrees, not how far you got in college, it's not about your IQ level. The knowledge we are talking about here is the knowledge that the Holy Spirit gives to God's children as they desire to grow and get into the Word of God. That is the knowledge we're, we're talking about here, and that's for each and every one of us. So we, we want to be careful, and as we look at this message, to not move from knowledge to feelings, but to understand that we have to grow. And in growing, we have to learn. The first thing that we learn, our first way of doing this is simply to say, I will follow Jesus. In Peter's time, they had mentors. 
And mentors were teachers, and that's what people learned from. So what happened then, there was not a classroom in the time period. You didn't meet in a classroom and, and do like you do today where a teacher will stand up and teach a lesson. A mentor was someone that, that you had to follow. You followed your mentor around in the highways and byways of life. You watch what they did. You watch how re they reacted. You watch how they spoke to people. And you grew in your knowledge from your mentor by following them. Jesus taught the same way to his disciples. Oh, there were times that he, he uh, gave messages and everything, but they followed him, and that's why they grew in knowledge of who Jesus is. In Colossians 2, 2 and 3, it says, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and unity and united in love, so that they may have a full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Throughout the Bible, Throughout the Bible, you see over and over about knowledge and learning and teaching and wisdom. It is not something that we are not aware of, but certainly we need to focus on. Jesus said in 14.6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't say, I am the way and I will teach you the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. And as we desire to grow in Jesus Christ, then we desire to learn from the truth, and that is Jesus Christ. He is our mentor, and the only way to learn from him, mentor, is to follow them. There is a beautiful song. It's an old song, but I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. It is, a, it is a conscious decision that for me and my life, I will be a follower of Jesus Christ. In being a follower of Jesus Christ, we must move from a spectator to an active player. You know, I love sports. But I'm in no condition to do any kind of sports now. The greatest sports I have is walking from my recliner to my refrigerator. That is it. But I enjoy the competition of sports. But there's also a difference when you become an active participant in that sporting event or whatever may be the event. You can only learn so much from just being a spectator of it all. It's getting involved in that. Did you know that the followers of Jesus were not called Christians to begin with? They were called disciples. Now, when we say disciples, well, let's look at Acts 11, 26. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Watch this now. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. The followers of Jesus Christ were originally called disciples. Now when we think of disciples, we think of 12 and, and one didn't prevail, so really 11. And we think about those are those unique those that walked with Jesus and the followers of Jesus. If someone asked you today, what church do you go to? Well, you may mention if you're visiting from your church, or you may say, I, I go to Safe Harbor Community Church. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. What are they going to do? They're going to look at you like, oh, no, it's one of these kind of churches. <laughs> they call everybody there a disciple, and they think they have a a certain encounter with Jesus Christ that no other church has, but it's really biblical. 
And to be honest with you, it would empower us, I believe. It would make us even stronger if we, well, let me say it like this. The word Christian is just thrown around everywhere. People say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Listen, folks, right now, I'm not going to be a judge of anybody. That's between them and, and Jesus Christ. But the Bible does say we will know them by their fruit. And sometimes there are those that will throw out the word, I'm a Christian, and then the very next moment you go, that's not very Christ-like. Let's be honest, we've done some of that ourselves, right? Sometimes we've had to fall on our knees to ask God for forgiveness. So we're not talking about perfection here, but you know what I'm referring to. You go up and down this road here, you're probably not going to find uh, one person that's an atheist. I don't believe in God. No, I'm a Christian. I don't believe in God. Well, good. The, the demons do that as well. But, but wouldn't it be something that as we pause and began each day to say, I am a disciple. Well, that is the children. That's power. But that's biblical. <clears throat> and to be a disciple means a disciple is a learner. And we've already discovered in briefly looking at this that the way that the learners, the pupils were taught, it was taught by a mentor. And the only way to be mentored is to follow that person around. <coughs> and in every area, everywhere that we can catch a glimpse of who they are, what they do, and how we do it, well, then we take it to our own lives and we apply it to our lives. Now, we know that our mentor physically is not walking around where we can walk like that. Folks, he's given us a He's given us the key to everything we need right here. So how do I follow Jesus? I read his book. And, and, and when, watch this. And when my mentor says that's how I react to people, that's how I do things, that's how I deal with life, when that comes in my life, when those temptations come to my life, I look at my mentor and I follow him. Isn't that amazing? Now, let's take up another offering. That's pretty good. So let's follow for just a second. <coughs> in Matthew, it reads, as, uh, night, as Jesus was walking beside... Hold on, let me get my... I'm, I'm so excited about... Uh, following the mentor that we uh, get a little tongue tied here as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee he saw two brothers Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew they were casting nets into the lake for they were fishermen come follow me Jesus said and I will send you out to fish for people at once they left their nets and followed him what would have happened if Peter said, no, not now. But I'll, I'll tell you what I will do. I will follow you from a distance. And as I, as people, because the word will get around, as people tell me what you're doing, I will stay in touch with what's happening and what you're doing. And at some point, at some time, I may evaluate if I need to know more about you. Well, it certainly wouldn't have the books that we're looking at today. But all the times in the Bible where it says Peter, it wouldn't be there. So we also want to look at this. If we say, Jesus, I do not want to be a disciple of yours. But I'll be happy to be a spectator. I'll be happy to see what's happening, what's happening in other people's lives. I will keep an eye on it. 
And at some point, at some time in my life, I may decide I want to get a little, know a little bit more about you. What will we miss out if Peter would have said something like that? What are God's children missing out on when they say, Lord, I'm okay with being a spectator. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, if you, if, I think of sports, and I think, man, it, there's quite a bit of difference when your favorite team wins a game or when you're on that team and you win a game. Amen? It's amazing. I was a part of it. We must move from, as I said, we must move from a spectator to an active player. We must also move from head knowledge to heart knowledge. Now, I'm talking about feelings, but really all this is you, you get it, you get your knowledge here, and then it becomes a part of who you are, the essence of who you are. It gets to your heart. And many of you can stand up and say, yeah, man, I got, uh, it started off of my head, but man, I got some heart knowledge. And how do you do that? Well, I can't read what I wrote here. Somebody else can read this for me. But anyway, <clears throat> knowing about someone and knowing someone is entirely different. Knowing someone requires some intimacy. Getting to know that individual. Getting to know about them. And many of you have some wonderful relationship with the church and praise God. They'll know them by the love that they have for one another. It's really knowing somebody. So how do we do that? First, it's I will study you. I will study my mentor. I will study you, Jesus. Now, that's not, that's not good church words, is it? Well, that's not good church words. Look for the next topic. Study the Bible as a textbook. And some of you all oh, know, I tell you what, when I was in college or when I was in high school, whatever may be the case, you say, listen, I learned what I need to do to get through the test, hopefully pass the test, and then I forgot everything about it. That was all I wanted to do. I've never been good at textbook. I've never been good at learning and, and reading things and retaining things, and that's not me. And uh, so, listen, I guess right now is the part where I just sort of move to the side. Well, but let's look at... But before you jump to that conclusion, you're going to be very limited in adding knowledge to your life if you don't study the textbook. Friends, I can't reiterate enough. We are to grow in knowledge by following our mentors. This is our mentor. Ezra 7.10 said, For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and the observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and the observance of the law. And guys, even if, if that type of textbook thought or that study and say, man, that's, that's not in my wheelhouse. There are so many resources available today. And they have evolved so much even when I began ministry. Commentaries, you can get apps, you can get all kinds of things that will help you in the study of your word. Now, let me tell you, you want to be cautious. You may want to look at someone that, is, um, that has used some of these. We want to make sure they're biblical. I will tell you this. The greatest commentary on the Bible 
is the Bible. Every once in a while, Liz or I will get an email that says, do you know what your credit score is? It will not cost you anything to find out your credit score. I had a cousin of mine one time who said, you know, I'm really seriously thinking about getting a brand new Cadillac. And my sister said, they obviously were open to discussion with each other. Isn't that a lot of money? He goes, well, I don't have money, but I got good credit. And so you can get a lot of things, even if you don't have the money, if you got good credit, right? Now you can ruin that credit. But on the credit score, it will give you uh, amount of whatever it may be. Um, I think last time I checked, Liz was way up there, and I think I owed points. But anyway, that's 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 it. It doesn't have anything to do with what I'm trying to say. But um, there is a spiritual score. Now, having a credit score is good to know. Don't need to check it every week, but. Um, but it's good to know what your credit score is in case you want to buy something and things like that. You can use it for leverage. <clears throat> there is a spiritual score that we have. And I believe that your spiritual score, that is where we are at, and my spiritual score, where we are at in our relationship with Jesus Christ will align pretty closely to our Bible study score. It is the only way, or one of the biggest ways, is to learn from the mentor, to follow him. And this is our textbook, to follow him. Ruth, uh, Ruth Graham, uh, Bell Graham, Graham Bell. Uh, I don't have this quoted exactly, but I, I don't think I've diverted from what she was trying to say. In her book, It's My Turn, she said that everyone needs a desk. It can be an old board that's crossed two blocks of wood. It cannot be a desk where you do sewing. Letter writing receipt filling or paying bills. It must be a place where the study of the Bible is the only thing that takes place on the desk. I have Bibles, books, a mug of pens, and a notebook. She went on to mention some other things she has on that, but it's all biblical related. She said, see, when I was in school, we always had a notebook to take notes on what the teacher was teaching. How much more important is it then to have a notebook beside you when Jesus is teaching you in your Bible study time? Ruth said, you need a place in your busy lives that you can go when you get a few minutes to have some refreshment and companionship. I like those words. Guys, I don't know about you, but I've heard people say, well, I've retired and, you know, I've all that, I've all this, I don't, I have less time now than I ever had in my life. Lives are busy. And to have a place that you can go that you just know that it is solely Bible study time. Time to be with Jesus. I like her words, refreshment, and companionship. I love that word companionship. Right? She knows she's going in the very presence of God. She is going to follow the mentor. The other thing, one, is we will study. We will study the Bible as a textbook. Also, we will study the Bible for survival preparation. Now, there is, there's a show that I think has been out for a long time called Survivor. Years ago, I watched it a couple times. I don't watch it anymore because I'm not really. Anyway, I just don't watch it.
But in that, many people have written that you are either coming out of a storm, a Bible for preparation, preparation for a storm. You're either coming out of a storm, you're in a storm, or you're getting ready to go into the storm. Isn't that the way life is? Now, I'd like to be able to tell you, listen, friends, you come to Jesus and you'll never have any more problems. Now, if I preach that every week, you need to get up and run out of here. Because we know it's not true, it's not factual. But in preparing for storms, we've got a survival book. 2 Peter 3, 1 and 2 says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. In Peter writing, I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thankful. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and, and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. See, friends, for a, I don't know about you, but in my work, I have to every year get recertified for a CPR. I don't know how many of you have had to do that, or many of you may already be certified in CPR. Uh, and you compressions and how many you do. Well, we hear from time to time that that someone is saved, and somebody goes, you know what? I remembered, and sometimes not, but I remember my CPR class. That's what helps save a life. We do not look to the survival book while the storm in the midst of the storm. Not saying that it will not be beneficial, but my friends, if you really want to know the survival book, be prepared. Already be a mentor of Jesus Christ, following the survival book. Because in there, it tells you that he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. It tells you I'll always be there through fire, through water. I will not leave you alone. I love you unconditionally. And every time I say that, and I say it a lot because I think, hallelujah, because I don't know how you love me all the time. It doesn't make sense to me. But he does. And he loves you. Even when you're unloved. Pretty awesome. Now, in the, the book that we find here that is the survival book or textbook, there's a few things we want to close with. One, I will obey you. But if, in 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light and he is the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. God will tell you what he, to, God will tell you to do something, and while you are doing it, he'll show you something else. That's the amazing thing about God. You go into your mentor, and I said earlier, you're looking and saying, okay, God says this, and that's what I need to do. I've implemented my life. When you get that, great things happen because you know that you're drawing closer to Jesus Christ, and right in the middle of you doing what your mentor has said for you to do, he gives you something else to do. And it's amazing. And all of a sudden, it's going to be a desire to, to go into the Word of God, to learn from your mentor on a very regular, consistent basis. The results of all this will be this. Your values will change. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that's where I get this from. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature... The old has gone, the new is here. Thinking about yourself, or maybe in, in talking to others, have you ever been around somebody who goes, you know what, I used to do this. I just don't miss it anymore. I don't do it anymore. It used to be a thrill in my life. But it's no longer that. As I follow my mentor, it's just not part of who I am anymore. That's the new creature. And your vision will change. The Holy Spirit will be your filter system 
that that you are sure you are sure to evaluate all things in life. Your Holy Spirit is your is your filter system. So when things happen, you think about your following your mentor through the Word of God, and then it will change your decision making based upon your relationship with Jesus. There's an illustration that I want to close with. There was a man in Michigan that was buying a, a farmhouse, had a barn, a couple other outbuildings, and on it on a shelf was a big black rock. So he talked to the man that he was buying from, he goes, What's up with the big black rock? Oh, that, that comes with it. You buy it, you get the big black rock. And, uh, well, okay, but so he got it and he used it to prop open his barn door. And after several years, he went to Central Michigan University to talk to a professor and said, Hey, would you look at this, <coughs> this big black rock? I don't even know where it came from. It turned out that it was the sixth largest meteorite ever in the state of Michigan. And its value was valued at over uh, six figures. A lot of money. And he said this about it. First of all, he said, I'm not using it as a door prop anymore. And then he said something pretty interesting. He called it a gift from heaven that will meet his needs and sustain his family for a long time. A gift from heaven, I guess literally it was, a meteorite. But my friends, we have a mentor, a gift. that will meet all of our needs and will sustain our families for a long time. Isn't that awesome? My goodness, we live in a day and age that people don't know what's going on, don't know what will happen tomorrow, and most of them are panicked out of their minds sometimes. And some that are not panicked out of their minds, they don't visually show it, but they are petrified of what's going to happen next in this world. Remember, you have a gift from heaven. That will sustain you and provide for your family for years to come. 2 Peter 1.3 says this, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Knowledge of Him it is a gift from heaven that will meet our needs and sustain the needs of our family for a long time. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what, I'm ready to attack Hill with Spirit. God is good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Father, as we look at our own lives, may we just say to ourselves, I want to be known as a disciple. A disciple of yours, a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord, I understand the Bible is a mentor because it is the word of our Lord. Father, I pray that I, as I follow the mentor, and study the word. Father, we know that our lives will be far better than they've ever been before. Lord, be with us during this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can stand if you like or remain seated.
Lord going to be doing in heaven? Praise the Lord. Let's see. What are, what's our practice? Let's see what our practice is going to be this week. How about one verse if he's got the whole world in his hands? Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. 